And we are live. You are watching the Alien Scientist channel. Well, what have we got going on tonight? Well, as we all wait for this UFO report to come out, let's talk about this, uh, this UFO report and what's going to be in it, hopefully. Um, we've already gotten some tidbits of information about this already. Um, so let's, let's just dive into it. It goes back to 1945, apparently, that they're now trying to go through all the, um, all the history and, uh, yeah, Merry Christmas, everyone, and hello. So we're going to talk about some of this, this deep history and get into, uh, uh, some of this stuff. Um, well, the Horton brothers were, uh, team of Nazi uh, airplane engineers and designers, inventors, that were um, quite ahead of the time. Um, they were developing V-shaped and other uh, odd-shaped aircraft uh, during the 1940s, um, some of which were actually um, captured in Operation Paperclip. And now, Operation Paperclip, if you don't know, uh, we brought about 2,000, uh, you know, hundreds, at least hundreds of, uh, of German scientists, engineers, and other intelligence um, experts that were abduct, uh, you know, induct, inducted or, uh, you know, taken from Nazi Germany and brought to the U.S., mostly to uh, a town in, called Huntsville, Alabama, um, where... They worked on a variety of top secret projects, including what the early rocket and um, shuttle programs, which would eventually uh, become NASA later on. And we're going to get into some of that and talk about um, some of the, those secret scientists. There's a group of 104 of the rocket scientists that were in, captured in Operation Paperclip and brought to the U.S., um, this was actually at Fort Bliss in Texas. So quite interesting, the amount of, there's Werner von Braun, the amount of intelligence that, that we must have gotten from them. Um, quite interesting, but one of the, one of the things about these um, V-shaped aircraft and some of the aircraft that the Nazis were working on towards the end of World War II is uh, that they are very, close in description to Kenneth Arnold's uh, first UFO sighting, where the term flying saucers came from. Um, Kenneth Arnold, the pilot, uh, made this sighting of these, these craft flying formation. And um, a lot of UFO people nowadays um, tend to believe that these may have been, you know, captured Nazi top secret aircraft that were being studied. And so <clears throat> to cover this up, the U.S. military, I'm sure, was um, more than happy to have the public believing that these craft that people were seeing flying around were actually, you know, space aliens or, um, you know, UFO, UFOs or, you know, so they'd rather they like this term UFO. Um, they've have from the very get go. Um, we have reason to believe that, uh, in, in fact, the CIA published an article called It Was Us, and they came out and tried to claim that all of the um, UFO sightings during the 1950s and 60s were actually um, them, their own top secret programs in one form or another. Um, a lot of them, they blamed on U-2 flights that they could, you know, link up the flight logs of, and the tracking of, of all these U-2 flights and uh, confirm that people were seeing these high altitude reflections and, and other things and reporting them. But what's interesting is, is the, the, the whole history of this. So they were working on right around this time, a lot of top secret stuff. Um, the Roswell Army Airfield was actually home to the atomic bomb squadron. So Roswell um, Army Airfield, it was where they uh, launched the atomic bomb out of during World War II. And um, 
it's right near Los Alamos as well, where uh, the first nuclear bomb was detonated. And, and, and so this would be a hot spot for UFO activities if we are to assume the reports are true that uh, these UFOs are very much attracted to um, radiation and nu nuclear energy. The fact that we figured out how to crack the atom and sent a massive signal into the cosmos um, saying, you know, hey, we've reached, uh, we've reached technological uh, coming of age. You might want to come and, and, uh, and keep an eye on us and, and what we're doing down here. Um, and of course, uh, months later, not too much long after Kenneth Arnold made his sighting, I'm, I'm about, I think it was a month after, I think he made that sighting in June, and then a month later, Roswell happens. Um, how the U.S. Air Force intelligence, you know, professionals like Jesse Marcel here, how these guys um, mistook a weather balloon for a flying saucer is beyond me, but this is, you know, what they reported. And, um, it, it's, it's just quite, uh, fascinating when you look at the whole Roswell, um, case as a whole, because you have Sheriff Wilcox and his daughters reporting that they got this material right to the office. Um, you know, this guy came into the office, I think it was Mac Brazel and, and, uh, you know, handed him a bunch of this, this memory foil and these material, this, this, uh, very thin metallic film that was very hard to cut or burn um, and would fold back mirror smooth into its original shape when crinkled up into a ball. I mean, mylar wasn't invented until uh, the mid-1950s, so there's very little explanation for what that material could have been. Um, but according to the Air Force, it was a uh, weather balloon and radar target, and that stumped all of our best peoples because Sheriff Wilcox had saved a piece of this and, and you know, brought, brought some of it down to the Roswell Army Airfield, you know, but obviously people who handled this material thought it was special. They reported these special amazing properties of the material. And um, then we have um, scientists like John Elroy Center who wrote um, the second progress report for for uh, for Battelle. So this was classified for uh, a long period of time. And uh, it's a whole study that was done in October of 1949 on research and development of titanium alloys, including methods for um, analyzing titanium alloys of unknown um, composition. And, uh, you know, where they would dissolve it in, in uh, carbon uh, tetrachloride and um, measure the off gases from these materials. So they were doing some sophisticated uh, chemistry on titanium alloys to basically uh, that if they had this material, which they couldn't break or burn, this would be the way that they would uh, analyze it. And we have the, we have the whole, um, summary report on this written by these metallurgists who worked for one of the top metallurgy firms at the time, um, a private institution called Battelle Memorial Institute, which is, of course, where you would bring these types of metals in 1949 if you wanted them analyzed in secret and um, no one to really talk about it. Of course, they did talk about it. John Elroy Center, you know, says that, hey, I, I, I was given some metals that I don't think we're made on this planet. And um, then it's just very curious how all these people reported these um, memory metals, these shape retention alloys from Roswell. Um, you had Battelle, our top uh, metallurgy contractors, doing this report, which was actually issued by Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base commissioned this actual report. And... Um, it's all right there in the literature. So 
they went and were researching the developing of these titanium alloys, including systems and methods for analyzing titanium alloys of unknown origin, and then by you know dissolving them in carbon uh, tetrachloride and measuring the off gases. And then um, one of the other things that they did was uh, to in this in this form they they looked at a lot of different uh, titanium you know, Kirk compositions of binary and tertiary alloys of titanium in, the, in these compositions. Um, but it's interesting that number two, these uh, titanium nickel alloys and, um, and number one, the, the titanium germanium alloys, and they may have done titanium germanium nickel alloys as well in, in these tertiary uh, ternary alloys. Um, so I think it's, it's quite interesting that the binary alloys of, tit of titanium um, with nickel has the most amount of research that was done. So they did all these research into all these other alloys, but they the one they, that they looked the most into were these nickel alloys. And uh, it's, it's super curious because shape retention metals, this specific specificity um, of this report and focusing on titanium nickel alloys and trying to learn as much as possible about titanium nickel alloys as opposed to the other um, metal alloys that they could have studied. <clears throat> and then the fact that nitinol, the first uh, memory metal, was produced by Naval Ordnance Research Labs uh, just a decade later after this report. So um, it shows that there may have been some secret government groups, X protect or whatever these, these programs are working on this type of uh, research during this, this, this time period. Very curious um, indeed that this John Elroy center fellow would tell his, uh, his family and also other journalists who interviewed him later on in life that, you know, yeah, I, I work with the stuff. I don't think it was made on this planet and I've seen a lot of stuff. This stuff was super interesting. And then it turns out that his boss was this guy named Dr. Howard C. Cross. And um, he wrote a lot of book with this Eastwood fellow who was actually the author of that report, uh, L.W. Eastwood. So he, he, he was the head of the author of that report. Uh, Center just worked on the analysis part with the, uh, the dissolving, um, the analytical methods for uh, titanium base alloys. So it's it's super interesting how these scientists come up in other investigations, like uh, the, for example, the uh, the Pentacle Memorandum, uh, which Jack Vallee found in J. Allen Hynek's notes after Project Blue Book. So J. Allen Hynek was the scientist who headed the uh, U.S. Air Force's Project Blue Book study into UFOs, and he had come across. Um, Stonewall is essentially in the investigation that it, it just looked like a continuation of, of Project Grudge, where they were trying to um, debunk UFOs as much as possible. And Heineck was originally, you know, all, all, all down for that. Uh, but towards the end of his career, he had a uh, turning of mind and a change of heart. Uh, so um, lots of uh, interesting things about this. So um, Dr. Edgar Mitchell also dropped some uh, hints about where he thinks that this stuff might have been. And uh, Battelle really fits the bill on this ET science, um, one of these places that should be looked at. I mean, f as far as uh, these crash recovery programs and everything go, it, the fact that I've been talking about it, a few other people have been talking about it. Um, I was very surprised to see it get mentioned on Joe Rogan with um, Jack Filet when he had Jack Filet on. But again, it was just like this thing that they kind of glossed over and, and no one paid attention to it or really looked into it further. But why don't we have this report going on and, and these congressional inquiries into the UAP topic? It would be, a, a you know, and, and they're good. They admit that they're going back to 1945 in the records and stuff. This would be, um, you know, if we want to go back to the start of UFOs, this would be the place to go, you know. So 
apparently these these uh, Horton parabolas. We had a couple of them at this you know facility. I don't know where this was, um, but. We were flying something around that looked like Horton parabolas back in, in the 1940s, which led, uh, sparked the whole UFO wave. And, um, and then NASA was not even started yet uh, when they were, they were doing this. But uh, I want to play some movies. This, is all, this has all been – uh, I'm going to share this with you guys because this is like all old stuff. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah. 1955 Disney uh, Walt Disney made this movie in conjunction with um, Werner von Braun and some of the scientists who are you know working on this pre NASA stuff. So let's get into some history, man. I'm probably gonna get a copyright strike for this. Build a rocket ship. The second and no less important is to prepare and train the men who are to fly the future rocket ships and to provide suitable working conditions that will enable them to survive in space. To help show you what is being done to solve these problems, we have called upon one of the foremost exponents of space travel, Dr. Werner von Braun, who is at present the chief of the guided missile division of the Army's rocket center at Redstone Arsenal. He was also overall director of the development of the original V-2 rocket. The training methods for future space flight with the special equipment needed for survival are much like those of present high altitude flying. And the experiments we are making today are helping us to solve the more complex problems to come. Take the present day pressurized flying suit, for example. It has been designed for use at extremely high altitudes and is a forerunner of the suits we will wear when we make that trip to the moon. To give you an idea of how engineers and medical men are working hand in hand, here are a few examples of the research that's being conducted at this time. This pressure suit is being worn in a test chamber where the air pressure can be dropped suddenly. Notice that the water boils at this low pressure, even though it is only at normal body temperature. Blood would be the same without the protection of the suit. In other tests, without the suit, where the drop in air pressure is less severe, we see that the body still reacts violently to a sudden decrease in pressure. Lieutenant Colonel John P. Stapp of the United States Air Force has subjected himself to the tremendous forces of a rocket sled that reaches a speed of over 632 miles per hour. The sled stops so quickly that Colonel Stapp's body becomes 35 times heavier than normal. From these tests, we have learned that men can take much greater acceleration forces and crew members of a rocket ship will undergo on a takeoff. Today's aircraft are so fast and so complicated that it has already become routine to try. So, by the way, with the last scene where they showed those pressure suits and all that, um, I just want to point out that one of the Nazi scientists, a guy named Hubertus uh, Strughold, actually... Um, was in charge of all the high, uh, all the pressure chamber experiments that were done at Dachau. So they did like all these Nazi inhumane, you know, concentration camp experiments. Um, and this guy was part of the whole team, brought all that knowledge to um, our military and to this program um, where they were able to subject, you know, human subjects to, you know, they were, they killed people in pressure chambers and, you know, just to see how much pressure it would take and what people could take and, and, and all that, uh, the medical, to get all the medical science and, and stuff. So he's talking about the medical scientists working with these people. Yeah, he's talking about Hubertus Strughold. Um, I'll spell the name for people that want to look it up. But, um, yeah, this guy was basically a Nazi war criminal that our intelligence agencies protected for years um, while these programs were going on. Um fascinating piece of, of, of the history so train the crews on the ground without risking lives or equipment this is done with a device called a flight simulator here the crews experience all the sensations of an extended flight the crews of future rocket ships will train much the same way we will use a simulator on a centrifuge and employ an astrosphere to train the celestial navigators for our coming space flights. 
Now here's a model, my design for a four-stage orbital rocket ship. Compared to the unmanned instrument rocket, it is quite large. But the overall size and weight of the rocket is mainly determined by the 11 tons weight of this top section. This weight dictates the amount of fuel and the numbers of motors needed to produce enough power to equalize the gravitational pull of the Earth. The payload in the top section will consist so this is pretty amazing because here we have pre-NASA. This is three years, uh, 1955, probably 1954 even, three, four years before NASA was created. Werner von Braun invented the space shuttle. So what happened, you know, we, we didn't do space shuttle, you know, this reusable craft. And the space shuttle he has is a triangle too. It's a flying triangle to boot. So just, let's just keep List going. of 10 crew members plus equipment. Notice the wings, small rocket motor, and landing gears. This is a section that must ultimately return the men to the Earth safely. To produce the energy needed to hurl this stage into the orbit, we need these three additional rocket-powered sections. Here we have a cutaway drawing of our rocket, showing the location of the fuel and the motors each section. The first stage carries 1,060 tons of fuel, and its 29 motors will lift the entire weight of the ship vertically off the ground. <laughs> Nitric acid and hydrazine, man. Um, so I don't know if this is on Disney+, Plus, but you can find it for free here on YouTube. It's called Man in Space, 1955. I think this is part one of it. Uh, so, yeah, hydrazine's, hydrazine's nasty stuff. So... My dad's a chemical engineer, and he had to work in a plant one time that makes hydrazine, and he had to have a $1 million uh, health insurance policy before they'd even let him go in, and work in that plant. Um, it is pretty nasty stuff. I mean, there's just absolutely no smoking at all in that uh, facility where they make that stuff. Uh, it is like I don't even think the people in the nearby neighborhood uh, know, know what they make there. and probably for their own peace of mind that they don't. The second stage has eight motors and carries 155 tons of fuel. It will be dropped at speed has reached 14,300 miles per hour. The next is our third stage with only one rocket motor and 13 tons of fuel. The third stage gives the passenger section the final kick to attain the orbit. It will not be separated from the passenger section until just before the return flight. The third stage will be left in space and a very small motor in the winged fourth stage will return the ship to the atmosphere so it can glide back to the base. If we were to start today on an organized and well-supported space program, I believe a practical passenger rocket could be built and tested within 10 years. Of course, it would be foolish to rush headlong into building a four-stage rocket, man it with a crew, and attempt to fire it into an orbit without first following a step-by-step -step research and development program. Let's illustrate this with the help of a few pictures. First, we would design and build the fourth stage, and then tow it into the air to test it as a glider. This would also allow the crews to practice. Next, low-altitude flights would be made, firing the small rocket motor in the fourth stage. This would also give the crew more and more training. Following that, the third and second stages would be constructed and tested very thoroughly on the ground, after which they would be joined to the passenger section so that faster and longer flights could be made up to speeds of about 12,000 miles per hour. The only thing remaining would be the building and ground testing of the huge first stage. Then there would be no more test flights. When all the sections are joined together, the ship and its crew will be ready for man's first flight in space. Let's look ahead a few years and see how this might be accomplished. There it is, a small atoll of coral islands in the Pacific. 
where man is dedicated to just one cause, the conquest of space. Here below us, a small city has been created to house the scientists, engineers, and technicians on whose shoulders rests the tremendous responsibility for this great adventure. This is the rocket assembly building with tracks running to the launching site. Only 48 hours remain until firing time. Our spaceship moves ponderously toward the firing site. the ship is securely anchored over the blast tunnel, the elevator spar is raised into place for the final pre-flight check and fueling. This is the blockhouse, the control center for Operation Space Flight. Here, the oscilloscopes, radar scopes, computers, and tracking devices are the brain and nervous system for the rocket. Dancing patterns of record every detail of the blast off and climb into space. In the windowless blockhouse, observation is by periscope. Through a system of worldwide radar stations, Electronic eyes will always be focused on the rocket as it orbits around the globe every two hours. The tracking radars report ready and are standing by. The optical tracking stations are poised and ready to follow the rocket in its upward flight. As zero hour approaches, the painstaking work of the checkout crew continues. The ship and every piece of its equipment is being checked and rechecked. Can you hear me? Can you give me that stage two separation signal again? Okay, now. Over. Now switch motor stage three to pitch right. Okay, now give me I don't want to get too much into that, but I do want to show the next part, and we're going to start talking about anti-gravity uh, research, especially what started in the, you know, 1950s. Hey, I'm Joe. Oh, Jesus. Well. And I'm one of the 30. I'm going to. Um, yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, do everything you can to help out with the algorithms because they've uh seem to be promoting a lot of crap these days and uh i guess people just want crap they really don't have the time for a lot of that the deep stuff so in any case uh <clears throat> let's get back into it this is part six of Mars and called Disney's 1957 the Mars and Beyond. The possibility of traveling to Mars in a spaceship has challenged the imagination of many men. Rocket ships of all sizes and shapes have been designed, but most of them rely on an enormous consumption of chemical fuel to escape the pull of the Earth's gravity. A spaceship using an electromagnetic drive to neutralize gravity is the obvious answer. But such a device is still a dream for the future. However, at the present time, an atomic-powered spaceship has been suggested by a leading scientist in the rocket and guided missile field, Dr. Ernst Stuhlinger, who for some years has been working closely with the rocket engineer, Dr. Werner von Braun. This atomic electric spaceship <coughs> features a revolutionary new principle that will make possible the long trip to Mars with only a small expenditure of fuel. Parts for this spaceship will be brought up to an orbit by conventional chemical fuel rockets. It will then be assembled in the vacuum of space. This unusual ship will be 500 feet across and will carry a small landing craft for the final descent to the Martian surface. 
Located at the bottom is a small atomic reactor which furnishes a continuous supply of heat. This heat turns silicon oil into steam. After rising up a central pipe, the steam drives a turbo generator which produces electricity to run the ship. The steam is condensed in a giant circular cooler and used over and over again. In the thrust chamber, a platinum grid is electrically charged. The metallic element cesium is vaporized and blown through the white hot grid. This ionizes the cesium atoms and they are then electrically blasted out into space at the rate of billions per second. This thrust pushes the ship in the opposite direction. The atomic electric spaceship can operate continuously for a period of years. At the top of the ship, away from the dangerous atomic reactor, is cargo space and quarters for a crew of 20 men. Mounted outside on the thrust chamber assembly is the auxiliary landing craft. When our ship reaches Mars, the landing craft will be released, carrying men and supplies to the planet's surface. A drag chute will gradually slow the landing craft as it streaks into the Martian atmosphere. A few seconds before touching down, the main rocket motors will be fired and the craft will land gently. All right, so we now uh, know that it's not going to be quite that easy um, to land and parachute into the Martian atmosphere. So um, if you look up uh, the NASA's flying saucer, they're building this new type of parachute device, apparently, to um, parachute down into Mars because of the really thin Martian atmosphere. Um, and there's this whole article on it. I wish I could uh, show you guys more of this. But this is kind of what it's going to look like. That's kind of what it does look like. Not exactly sure how it works. Inflatable. What? But that's it. Um, yeah, let's get back to this. Uh... I've been thinking a lot about the unimaginable situations oh, families in Afghanistan, Syria, and other crisis areas are living through. These ads are just killing me. Century. I pay for YouTube premium. Uh, traveling to Mars okay, in a I think it ran out or something. Challenge, challenge the imagination of many men. Rocket ships of all sizes and shapes have been designed, but most of them rely on an enormous consumption of chemical fuel to escape the pull of the Earth's gravity. A spaceship using an electromagnetic drive to neutralize gravity is the obvious answer. But such a device is still a dream for the future. However, at the present time, an atomic-powered spaceship has been suggested by a leading scientist in the rocket and guided missile field, Dr. Ernst Stuhlinger, who for some years has been working closely with the rocket engineer, Dr. Werner von the Earth. Oh, this is it. They... At zero hour, the thrust chambers are fired. We are underway. Our fleet climbs beyond the space station, beginning its outward spiral around the Earth. The speed is increasing steadily. After four months and 17 days, 850,000 miles out, the expedition finally escapes the Earth's gravity. At six months, 14 days, our speed has increased to 75,000 miles per hour. Mars is steadily increasing in size. The halfway point has been reached.
The thrust chambers are reversed. Deceleration begins. The Earth grows smaller. At seven months, 24 days, crew members witness a spectacular passage of the Earth across the face of the sun. Three months later, the expedition is 700,000 miles above Mars, and the 45-day spiral in toward the planet has begun. Now, for the first time, the tiny Martian moons Deimos and Phobos are visible to the unaided eye. As we move to within 4,000 miles of Mars, we get a close-up view of the moon Phobos. After 13 months and six days, our voyage to Mars is finally completed. The ships are orbiting 620 miles above the surface of the planet. Before exploration begins, test missiles are fired to sample the strange new atmosphere. Now the first landing craft is moved into position to attempt the hazardous 600-mile drop to the Martian surface. This is a crucial moment. There's Elon's rockets. Look, look at this. Elon Musk, right here. Where did he get the idea? Look at that. When Earthman finally walks upon the sands of Mars, what will confront him in this mysterious new world? Will any of his conceptions of strange and exotic Martian life prove to be true? Will he find the remains of a long dead civilization? Or will the more conservative opinions of present day science be borne out with the discovery of a cold and barren planet where only a low form of vegetable life struggles to survive? These questions will be answered by our space pioneers of the future. In solving the enigma of the red planet Mars, Man may find a key that opens the first small door to the universe. Carried forward on the wings of modern science, man in the years that follow may discover the miracle of life as it exists in all its countless forms throughout an infinite creation. So oh, now we're that was pretty cool now. Did you guys see that? This taking work at the checkout. Oh man, that was great. Right at the end of that, dude. I like this part where they show this they show it doing this thing in front of the craft to make it fly. So it's got the flying saucer and it's it's got this thing going on in front of it. So this is super interesting. Um, a number of interesting things were going on at, around this time. So Bonson Labs, as people know, um, we got the full video here. I don't know if this is it. But uh, yeah, so Bonson Labs, we know that during the 1950s, the late 1950s, there was anti-gravity research going on in a couple um, institutions and, and, and different places. And one of the people that was working on it was a guy named Thomas Townsend Brown. Uh, Brown was uh, 
convinced that you know they were going to uh, discover this. Got a bunch of funding from um, this Bonson, uh, Andrew Bonson and Company, who was uh, they made they made actually um, air conditioners. So they were an air conditioning uh, manufacturing company. So they had a lot of money from making a lot of air conditioners in the 1950s and um, used that money for anti-gravity research. Uh, a number of different craft were, were built and tested, different designs, different setups. Um, real interesting times, real, uh, real interesting stuff. Um, but some of the people that came in and, and looked at, uh, visited the lab and um, offered insights in physics and, and, and research and, and science and stuff. Um, we're particularly, uh, I, I've talked about the secret college before, Diane Walsh Pasulkas uh, mentioned this before in, in uh, her book, American Cosmic, um, and, and other sources have talked about this, but uh, Rice and, and Cecil do it. Um, where this husband and wife team who worked on a number of physics experiments. Um, but one of the things that's interesting in, in the, in the sixties, they uh, started getting more into um, the real, the real physics of this stuff. So I guess we can move on to, um, to really talking about all, all the, uh, the physics stuff. So I'll go ahead and, and, uh, and get into that. So but before we get into all that, I mean, it kind of, there's a lot of overlap, a lot of stuff going on with, with the physics at the time and, and science at the time. 1946 Nobel Prize in Physics was actually for nuclear magnetic uh, resonance, which was discovered by uh, Edward Mills Purcell, uh, who won the Nobel Prize in Physics for that. Uh, Felix Bloch and Edward Mills Purcell. Uh, Purcell, around 1947, um, the CIA approached Purcell, and, you know, as they do a lot of times with uh, really intelligent physicists who are on the cutting edge of uh, scientific research, they, um, they get in with these people, and um, they hire them for programs. So CIA hired uh, Purcell for a top-secret program called uh, Operation, I mean, Project Rainbow. And Project Rainbow was, is, I've talked about Project Rainbow before, but it, it's, it's important because this is where they basically figured out metamaterials. And uh, it was the start of a lot of the stealth program in, in, the, in the United States. So, and a lot of this stuff, uh, the stealth pro research relates to a lot of the X uh, protect and um, X tech file as we see later. Um, but do it is interesting, you know, as this member of the secret college uh, along with his wife at the university of unassuming university of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, you know, um, they didn't pick, MIT or Stanford or any of these top uh, physics schools that they wanted a, a scientist who had the, the right understanding and knowledge and background in the field. And, um, and that was uh, do it. He was uh, really into um, a lot of the research on uh, bring, you know, uh, with the uh, Wheeler, uh, John Archibald Wheeler in the, in the late 1940s and fifties. 1950s he was working on a lot of uh, einstein's theories and this unification and, and these ideas for unifying physics and whatnot and um <clears throat> he was working uh with uh, guys like bryce do it and um and also sending some of his brightest uh grad students along to help out with with some of this research as well so um interesting we get into 
I'll get into some of this, um, you know, some of these forgotten relativists of the, of these this age. There's there's a lot of papers on a lot of these guys that did a lot of uh, the physics theory that was uh, of interest at the time. But one of the things they had at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill was this 1957 quantum gravity meeting. Uh, oh no no, this wasn't the this is a different meeting. 1957 saw two different meetings um, with Do It. That Do It. Uh, Do It wrote a report on the first meeting and brought it to this other meeting, but it, there was parts and, and certain things left out, um, which is which is super interesting because uh, we'll get into this in a second, right? Lots of lots of interesting connections, and and uh, I had heard about this a little bit before, but uh, you know who really got me down this rabbit hole was Eric Weinstein. And him talking about um, some of the people that he started studying, you know, on that, you know, the thing with Hal Putoff that he did on Jesse Michaels. And, and he's brought up a, a, a lot of these things and some of his other um, stuff. But, yeah, there, there's there's a lot of interesting connections here uh, because this Chapel Hill uh, conference in January 1957, so early January 1957, they have this Chapel Hill conference in North Carolina where all these top scientists meet to discuss um, quantum gravity. What's the real nature of quant quantum? Uh, how, do, how, does, how do we unify, how do we quantify gravity and, and, and actually come up with a, a better theory of gravity than, than we have? And um, this was the first really big gravity conference. And, and I know that it was uh, actually funded the financial support came from UNESCO National Science Foundation Wright Air Development Center and the U.S. Air Force Office of Ordnance Research, U.S. Army. So this conference was um, an activity of the North Carolina Project for the Institute of Field Physics, established in 1956 at, in the Department of Physics at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, which was, again, established by Bryce Dewitt, who had these close connections with uh, Wright-Patterson to do a lot of this research. So he gets the permission and the funding to, to hold this gravity conference, and he invites all the top scientists, including Richard Feynman. And it's interesting that Richard Feynman went to this conference, didn't tell anybody, kept it completely top secret, and he attended the conference under the pseudonym Mr. Smith. So this is Richard Feynman, the world's top theoretical physicist, the, the smart, one of the smartest uh, men ever to walk the planet, and um, one of the best and brightest Nobel Prize winning physicists ever. And here he is going to this gravity conference in 1957 under a fake name. And he's talking about ideas and sharing ideas with people at the conference that he's never shared with anybody, anywhere, before. Um, which is super interesting. So let, let's let's get into this, right? So one of the things he does is he shares this idea. Okay, um, Bob Ford doesn't come along till later. Uh, we'll get into that and some of the other anti-gravity research. We're still in 1957. So 1957, we have this, we have Richard Feynman going to the secret gravity conference under the pseudonym, um, Mr. Smith. And in that conference, at that conference, um, he proposes, right? And you can find this if you look up the sticky bead argument. So this guy, Herman Bondi, was the first to publish uh, this idea out of general relativity. And um, it's credited to Herman Bondi, okay? And if you guys don't know who Herman Bondi was, Bondi was the first technological director of ESA, which is Europe's NASA, so the European Space Agency. So the head of technology and, and senior tech development at ESA, which is Europe's NASA, was this guy, Herman Bondi. Oh, and thank you for the $20 super chat, man. That's awesome. Cheers. Appreciate that. Now, Bondi writes this 
sticky beat argument down. He gets the idea from um, Richard Feynman. And uh, apparently, I don't know, one of the other guys at the conference or um, I'm not sure if he was, uh, who's his doctoral advisor? Um, okay, so this is interesting. Yes, Kevin Keith J. Laidler. Um, I believe he was at the conference. Yes. So he got in um, this Guggenheim Fellowship and got in with John Archibald Wheeler. This is Joseph Weber. And Joseph Weber came up with the idea of these gravitational wave detectors called Weber bars, which were based on this sticky bead argument that, you know, Feynman and uh, came up with and gave to Bondi. So this Weber bars, and, and this is, is super interesting because Weber is one of the key scientists, I believe, on this X-Protect file um, for, for a number of years throughout this, this period. Um, he's doing the physics research. He's building the gravitational wave detectors, okay, similar to the giant ones we have with LIGO, okay? But he could apparently build smaller ones. Some say that they didn't work, but that might have been disinformation or something. Um, this whole idea is that uh, I've heard rumors that they have satellites with these Weber bars um, set up in them and that the NRO has had uh, these types of satellites set up since, you know, the 19. 19- you know, 80s at least with uh, Star Wars, with, with the Star Wars program really started taking this uh, weaponization of space seriously. Um, but these detectors are there specifically to detect any um, artificially created gravity waves. So if you create a wormhole, if we, if we, if Mark down in his, at the lab in New Jersey uh, creates a wormhole with one of his experiments uh, tomorrow, they have satellites in space that can see this stuff. And according to some people that we've talked to, um, people have said, come to me and said, listen, I created one of these things, one of these wormholes in my garage under with an experiment that I did. And I suddenly got a knock on my door. Um, You know, within 24 hours, I had a knock on my door and they had no, they knew exactly what I built and, we're coming to look for it. Uh, so this whole idea kind of may sound like science fiction. I, and, and again, I, it sounds like a conspiracy theory because there's no uh, solid evidence for, for this. But um, it might be something that the right people could look into and look for. Because if we have, you know, these um, maser and laser, you know, so he did a lot of the early work on masers and laser technology and these gravitational wave detections and these uh, quantum electronics and stuff. So if there's something in Weber's uh, research that, you know, shows this, um, there, there might, it might be worth looking into. And if not Weber, certainly Weber's a di- a doctoral student, who is Robert Forward, um, Robert L. Forward, <laughs> as you know, uh, was an aerospace engineer, an American physicist and science fiction uh, writer, also a a major contributor to gravitational wave detection research. So um, Forward also would go on to write um, the, uh, what what did Forward, it was 1970, it was 1970s, Oh, it's not on here, but the, he did the, um, why can't I think of this? This was the, uh, the this was the gravity paper, um, Project Outgrowth. Project Outgrowth, that was the name of it. It's, I can't even put it on here. It took me a second to think of this. But yeah, Project Outgrowth was the 1970 study on major propulsion technologies that was uh, done by Air Force rocket propulsion laboratories at, at Air Force Base in, you know, Edwards, California. Uh, so Forward, I believe, took um, part in, in this and, and a number of uh, other research related to, um, you know, the U.S. Air Force and the CIA's interest in gravity and propulsion research and technologies and stuff. So, 
yeah, so big jump there from going right from the 50s to, to the 70s on, on the things that they tried because there was a number of other things, papers written and, and things, other things that they tried on the in-between. Um, one of the papers that was written was uh, gravitational drag in rotating superconductors. And that was written by Bryce Dewitt in 1966, I believe. Yeah, so this paper is, is important because um, it shows that, you know, again, these top gravity researchers were on to this idea of using superconductors, uh, rotating superconductors for gravitational drag and uh, creating, you know, artificial um, gravity fields. So this would be um, a place to look for additional research, uh, including you know, the ideas like that Ed Fouché and others have talked about with these frozen, you know, uh, super cooled mercury um, being used because everyone knows that, you know, you cool mercury down to the right temperature, it becomes a superconductor. It's been well known for over 100 years. And uh, this might be a way to, you know, this, this rotating mercury, um, and it could be a plasma. I don't know. There might be something there, but uh, it, it, it makes sense with um, the, there's actual physics now that we have to look into something with this. And uh, there's even more physics when we look into um, what are called bipolarons. Bipolaronic uh, superconductivity, right? So there's another... In addition to BCS theory, there's another theory of superconductivity, um, which call, is called bipolaronic superconductivity. And it might be possible that um, in these mercury plasma solution uh, that you're creating bipolarons and that that's what's uh, responsible for the superconductors. So there are some physics here that uh, we can now test and look into with regards to this um, ideas of rotating liquid mercury um, gravity drive engine the the, the you know the mercury uh, liquid mercury centrifuge engine uh, that talked about 20 years ago when I first started my channel so it sounds like interesting a lot of disinformation yeah mixed in there of course with a lot of the stuff that Ed Fouché had said about um, the TR three B's, you know, propulsion system in that magnetic magneto hydrodynamic drive and how it functioned. Um, yeah, lots of lots of questions there, but it, it's definitely something that they could have looked into, and in that I would imagine, you know, there's enough physics there that you know it would it, it, they could have written a grant and got funding back in the '60s, early '70s, you know, early early '70s to do this research. So. Um, Again, this is um, all cool stuff, but uh, the whole TR3B story kind of um, went south on me uh, personally when I discovered the whole um, Teledyne Ryan um, black triangles. So Teledyne Ryan, uh, you know, Ed had always said that, you know, TR stood for you know, not technical. Normally TR in, in uh, airplane lingo stands for tactical reconnaissance for TR aircraft, technical reconnaissance. But uh, apparently um, the TR and TR-3B wasn't, uh, you know, it was stood for Teledyne Ryan potentially not uh, – TR. So this is all, this is good stuff, man. Wiki spooks. This is like my article and some of my stuff. So this is good. I like this. Um, there's a Teledyne Ryan. And I did a whole video on this going over all the different Teledyne Ryan um, black triangles and stuff and, and showing videos and, and everything. Uh, so the TR3A Black Manta, it's called. And uh, this was a real craft, but it, unfortunately it was a drone. There's some pictures of it. These, 
the, the drones that they built. And they were meant to be super quiet and stealthy. This thing's about three feet, maybe four feet across. So this kind of like put the damper on the, a lot of the TR-3B stuff for me because it just is like, all right, this is a cover for a lot of stealth drones that they were flying around and they wanted people to think it was this, you know, something else. But of course, these things are three, four feet across. And Ed Fouché always said that the TR-3B was, you know, hundreds of feet across. Um, where are they? could have built or supported such an aircraft like that. I don't know, but it sounds like a lot of disinformation and, and nonsense to me. And of course, here we are still talking about it years later and stuff, but yeah, this mer mercury plasma accelerator ring called the magnetic field disruptor or MFD. And he said 60,000 RPMs, which is really, really fast. I mean, that will rip a dental drill. That's like faster than the dental drill uh, spins. I think a dental drill is like 20. 25 or you know something like that so that's just ridiculous speed uh, a lot of things would just tear themselves apart under that the forces of that kind of uh, that s speed of a rotation and um this of course 25 000 atmospheres of pressure makes no sense either so a lot of the the technical aspects are just bunk um but doesn't stop the idea that you know 1957 we've got the top scientists looking into these ideas of gravity and if you trace the work of of a lot of these guys throughout the decades after you find that a lot of them um worked on or or were at least you know satellite help to a lot of these other top secret uh, gravity research programs and um and science projects so so or or their their students were you know the people who studied under them would would go on to do these other so it's a key it's a small group it's a small um tight-knit community but um and that makes it more obscure and harder to find these people but once you know them and you you have the name i mean you hit the jackpot and you can just find so much stuff once you get some names of the people who worked on it and uh Look this stuff up. It's, it's all out there. Tons of information. You, this is NASA documents. And the reason they were looking at this was for UFO research. So again, this all relates to the UFO file and, and the, the, the investigation that Congress is doing right now into UFOs and the top secret history of that. Um, lots of stuff to look into here, man. Um, and then Bonson, of course, working with uh, Wheeler and um, Bryce Dewitt, you know. It's all there, man. It's, it's lots of lots of lots of detailed sources. Um, more stuff I can't really get into just yet because uh, I'm waiting. I'm hoping that Eric Weinstein will join in uh, you know, doing a, a debate or a talk about this because, you know, he seems to think that um, you need these mathematics people and the um, differential geometers and the people who really do this type of advanced relativity theory uh, to be able to unlock the type of math that he thinks um, you need to create warp drives or, or this, this next gen technology. This, of course, there's lots of people who disagree with him. And, um, and we'd like to talk to all this, everyone, all the smart people in the room get them together. I love watching them talk to each other and debate. Um, this group I had mentioned, I think, in a couple past streams and sometimes before uh, called Rias in Baltimore. And I actually went and interviewed the only surviving member of Rias that I could find. I think he's like, not, he's, he's in his 90s now. And, he, and uh, I have that interview. I haven't posted it or shared it yet. Uh, but he had some interesting information to share that he knew more, more about the mathematics group and the mathematicians group that moved to Brown university in 64. Um, and he said that they were different. The math group the, were different from the physics group and that he didn't really know a lot of the guys in the physics group or what was going on in the physics group. Um, he said that the, the math group, uh, he never worked on anything classified and no one in, in his group ever worked on anything classified to his knowledge. Um, but he wasn't so sure about the physics group and what had gone on with them. 
And he did reveal that the reason that they moved to Brown University in 1964 and left uh, their original facility in Baltimore was because the physics group had been accused of dumping nuclear uh, or radioactive waste into a nearby lake, which was behind where their, their facility was. So some interesting stuff there. I, I haven't looked deeper into that. Of course, it was in 64. Um, but yeah, what happened to that physics group? What were they dumping? Was it just, he's, according to him, it was just rumors and that they hadn't dumped anything. And it was just a, a, a stupid rumor that someone had started. But there might be more to that story. And um, it would be interesting to find out who was involved in that physics group uh, for this RIAS or in Research Institute for Advanced Studies. Um, yeah, a lot of interesting stuff. So, um, yeah, Senior Peg, yeah, Teledyne Ryan Scarab. Oh, yeah, that's different. That's like what became the uh, modern day drones and stuff. Oh, yeah, the Glenn Martin Company. This is what was, this is what it was before it was Lockheed Martin. And uh, Glenn, Mar they were they were funding this institutes like Rias to do like research for them back in, in you know before the Mansfield Amendment and uh, that kind of stuff was made more difficult or impossible to do. But um, Glenn Martin was an interesting guy. He he um, he really pioneered um, aircraft flight. So he was trying to get money to start his own company and, and do more stuff with airplanes. And uh, everyone, airplanes were super new at the time, and uh, he wanted to prove that these things could work. So he built, he had built his own airplane, uh, or gotten an airplane from someone who had built it, and he was flying it uh, to deliver mail. So that's what he he got he got to start delivering mail and packages in a uh, small like Wright Brothers aircraft way back in like 1911, trying to prove to uh, investors that it you know, could, it could work and that it was something, you know, worth investing in, you know, and a lot of people didn't believe him. People with money didn't believe him at first. It took, it took a lot for him to show them and, and convince them and get, and get money and investment uh, to build his aircraft company, which we wouldn't have Lockheed Martin today if it weren't for that. Um, that's an interesting, some interesting history there. Yeah, Joshua N. Goldberg is another interesting um, member of that uh, group. Goldberg and Peter Bergman were both there in, in 1957 in January at the Chapel Hill Conference. And, you know, it's interesting that, you know, he says that he gets into this UFO stuff and, and then he's looking for these, these type of people that were involved in this. And that's why I thought this whole meeting and, and this stuff was interesting. Um, and he was actually really, you know, delighted with a lot of the research that I had done into this already. And, and a lot of the connections I was able to make in, 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 in into this from the names and, and the people that are all so intimately connected when you get into this type of research uh, and really start connecting the dots. Um, but again, there he keeps getting referred to a lot of these material science people whenever he tries to get close to the ufo file they keep you know we'll check out you know talk to this material scientist and this this person so apparently a lot of the research that's been done is into the materials and trying to understand the materials and, and really get an understanding of that but it, there's a there's a missing there's clearly as eric any any smart intelligence person knows that there's clearly a missing gap here between um, you know, so if we have these recovered metals and these pieces um, from UFOs that we're analyzing in these um, labs like Battelle, for example, and we're coming up with uh, these new, you know, understandings of material science through that, um, maybe we're not getting the full picture of what is, you know, the physics of what is going on with these materials and how they're being used, um, how they actually function. So there is that disconnect, I believe, um, 
which is why he, Eric's frustrated with the answers he's getting from the material scientists. You know, oh, we found this, we got this and this, but and he's also getting frustrated with the uh, lack of connection on the other side of it with the um, differential geometers and theoretical scientists who are looking into UFOs and saying that, you know, we kind of have these theories and these ideas and, and you know, talk to Hal Putoff and his whole, you know, polarizable vacuum through, you know, negative refractive index materials and um, how they those can be used to to bend space time, you know, Jack Sarfati, similar theories. Um, talking about these pumped metamaterials with uh, you know you get enough of these light this light going in these in these metamaterials, um, and you can you know create uh, lamb waves, pump these wave modes. They have some really interesting properties and and, and um, abilities. But uh, this whole idea of this craft being the hall itself being like a, a like a musical symbol where the thing vibrates itself um the amount of the, the way that you could lay wave modes on top of um a material which is both you know vibrating mechanically and also um atomically through um trapped light there might be some physics there which uh we don't really understand completely and uh, yeah so then the gen the consequences of a general excess of charge this is another interesting connection that bondi wrote this article in september 1959 you know talking about super you know things with excess charge and you, you charge stuff up i mean this is the this is this is the exact research that was being done at bonson labs 1958 1959 the same exact time they're charging things up and um, doing the experiments on it. And here we have these gravity scientists writing the papers on it. And um, also, you know, me having these meetings. This was 1972. You got Kip Thorne, Bryce Dewitt, um, and Yuval Neiman all, uh, all working on this. This looks like it could be Ed Witten or something. It kind of looks like Lewis, Witt, Lewis Witten from behind almost. Uh, would be surprised if it was him but um again Witten uh was there at this conference doing that then you look up uh Witten's oral histories on AIP this is American Institute of Physics uh Rickles and Salisbury did this interview with uh with Witten and Witten says that you know he was working in Baltimore um it's not the Glenn Martin company. He said he toured the, there, and uh, but he was working for this. So he's working for um, in Baltimore for this Glenn Martin company, and he was working on um, in 1947 or the 1940s, anyways, as early as 1947. He was working on pilotless uh, aircraft, and this is admitted to in his. Uh, Thing. The CIA basically hired him to work on top secret research for pilotless aircraft, the drone, drone technology as early as 1940. And um, so there's some a lot of interesting aerospace tech and secret science connections as well going on behind the scenes uh, there. Um, ran into this other guy named uh, Henry Colm, an American physicist associated with MIT for many years with extensive expertise in high powered magnets and strong magnetic fields. Oh yeah. This is the guy that invented the, uh, built the rail guns and the mag and the, did the maglev train research and a lot of the, uh, rail gun research for the, uh, for the Navy and for the military. Yeah. Henry Combs, his name. Yep. Bender, Albert Bender, author of the 1962 nonfiction book, flying saucers and the three men. So he served in the U.S. Army Air Forces during World War II, and he was obsessed with the UFO phenomenon, became a UFO researcher, and founding the International Flying Saucer Bureau. In 1965, he founded the Max Steiner Music Society. And, uh, yeah, this guy was uh, an author and UFO researcher. And... Um, Really cool guy, man. 
Wish I could have met you, dude. Yeah, so some interesting early researchers of ufology, you know, that, of course, the, the UFO Twitter or the modern ufology, George Knapp and Jeremy Corbell would like you to, you know, forget all about this history and all about all these people and think that the UFO file is all about them and Bob Lazar and, uh, and everything else. So Bob Lazar, of course, people need to research the Bob Lazar timeline. This is the first place that I send people to uh, who are new to Bob Lazar and uh, new to the research. Um, I tell them to go here and check out um, Tom Mahood's website, otherhand.org, and, and just search for the Bob Lazar timeline. Um, of course, Jeremy Corbell is now trying to twist around the Jerry Freeman story to make it sound like it actually um, promotes his garbage. Um, but you can read the 25-page uh, version of Jerry Freeman's story here um, on otherhand.org. And um, you can read. He walked right out in Up Nine Canyon, right up onto Papoose Lake, and walked right out there looking for this trail of the Lost 49ers. Um, died of cancer from you know going out there with all the radioactive material at that site papoose lake is one of the worst uh for radioactive uh, materials by the way if you look up project 57 you can find tons of information about all the you know toxicity of these locations um all the bombs that were blasted off right nearby at the uh, nevada test site it's just a radioactive wasteland most of this area uh, so it's no surprise that Jerry Freeman died of cancer after uh, visiting that site. But it's just disgusting that, you know, opportunists and shameless liars like Corbell will try to take advantage of people's ignorance um, to the story to try to make it look like it actually promotes his garbage uh, when it completely debunks it. Um, oh, yeah. So his movie, by the way, um, Bob Lazar, Area 51 and Flying Saucers, it, it's, it's now free. So you can watch it for free now. Um, so maybe now that it's free and not monetized, uh, I won't get hit with the copyright strikes and I can post my um, full um, parody version of his documentary, which I, I tried posting two, three years ago and, and got so many copyright strikes. I almost got my channel taken down by Mr. Corbell, um, who's not too happy with um, all the clips that I posted in the real Bob Lazar story. Um, but yeah, that's that's a whole nother case. I mean, I could I would do a total 180 on Bob Lazar if uh, we came up with uh, a stable isotope of that element 115, or if any of the science of anything he talked about, you know, was confirmed in, in any any sort of way. Of course, um, you know, I remain skeptical of him, just like I remain skeptical of a lot of this other uh, other research and stuff. But um, where I'm at right now with the ufology and the anti-gravity research is these these uh, these pumped cavities of light, and um, you know what's called liquid light. You're trapping light and, and you're turning it into this liquid light. Um, so they can do this at room temperature, and. Yeah, literally, when they, once they are able to do this, they're going to have room temperature superconductors, and then you're going to be able to have stuff that uh, can float right on um, air or right in a very weak magnetic field. So they'll be able to warp the space-time around the craft as well with these optical materials. So they have these optical materials. Um, negative refractive index, right? The whole idea of this refractive index, um, very interesting materials you can create with uh, these. And if you can produce the right type of material, it can do negative refractive index for a wide spectrum of frequencies. And I think that's what you need to trick, to trick gravity. Because gravity, it seems to be um, this communication effect of this entanglement of everything being connected and talking to each other because it's and uh the whole idea is that gravity is caused by this it's basically uh what's called the maritime casimir effect so 
the Casimir effect is this whole idea that um, you're blocking the ways between you and, uh, so say that you're a boat. The maritime Casimir effect is really easy to understand and visualize because it, it's uh, it helps you understand the whole idea of how this this wave wave connection works. Um, Casimir effect. Let's see if we can find this. So the maritime analogy of the Casimir effect is is as follows: so You get two boats, right, and all the waves in the sea are going all around, right? So the when you have these two plates, the waves between the two plates or the two boats um, are all damped except for the, it damps out all these other waves except for a few of the frequencies because only the frequencies, basically only the wavelengths that, that um, can, the only wavelengths that can exist in this space between the two boats are the wavelengths which are harmonics of the distance of that space between the two boats. So it basically blocks all those waves so that there's an uneven pressure on the outside and what happens is it pushes the two boats together slowly and they've done this in, in wave tanks and wave chambers um, and they've taken this out of a lot of the educational materials uh, of talking about gravity and, and all the uh, they don't want people to know what gravity is they don't want people to know that it's it's pretty much this easy that it's this, we live in this sea of electromagnetic energy that connects everything at the speed of light and that everything is connected at the speed of light communicating with each other but when you have these two plates it blocks out the frequencies between the plates and so you get this uneven pressure and, the, and it pushes the two plates together so the boats will actually um, end up together if you put the two boats in a wave uh, chamber every time that they'll end up uh, they'll end up together they'll end up crashing into one another because the, the waves between the two boats are damped and it, there's an uneven surface pressure um, around. So the whole idea is that if you can, you can't really, um, so the speed, of, the speed of light is the speed of light. You can't really beat the speed of light. Uh, but you can, in this one local environment, uh, increase that speed of light. Um, as long as you don't increase the, you can increase the, the phase velocity, just not the group velocity. And... Um, that's an that's an interesting concept because what you can do is uh it travels around the material so this is like because it travels in an arc it travels faster than the speed of light but the group overall group velocity still has to obey the speed of light um so the whole idea is that if you can create these wave forms with the with the light and you create enough of these frequencies so that you can all, so that all the light coming in incident on this craft is bent around the craft itself and goes out. What would you see when you see this craft? Do you see something similar to that uh, flight of the navigator ship? Um, you know, where it looks like this mirror, where it's invisible, and then it comes out of invisibility, and, 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 and you can actually see it, right? So when they, they turn this um, stealth mode on or whatever, the, the, the skin on, it bends the light around the craft and makes it invisible. Now, in addition to making it invisible to light and to the visible um, sites, right? It also may be able to make it invisible to gravity. So this is the nature of the experiments that we're trying to do currently is figure out, well, how do we make things invisible to light? And then can we make them invisible to gravity as well if we make them invisible to you know say all frequencies of light or maybe it's just a select few frequencies of light for which uh through which you know gravitational waves are mitigated maybe on a bandwidth so that if we you know can warp these certain frequencies of light we might be able to warp that bandwidth of gravity around but i really think it's the whole entanglement um, puzzle as a whole which creates gravity in, in a more complex um, method so that the essential way to think about these the skins of your alien craft are, are to think about them as um, you know qubits think of them as, a, as qubits in a quantum computer so these quantum computers that we're designing um, currently at you know places like Microsoft and Apple and Intel and Google um, these 
are very primitive um, compared to what an alien might have. And in an alien, um, the qubits could be just across the distributed across the entire surface of, of this craft um, in a sense, in essentially stable state. Uh, and if it's invisible, then it's essentially shielded from um, a lot of the errors that are inherent in, in normal um, quantum computer processing. So, uh, well, it's not just uh, these metamaterials are, the metamaterials are an aspect of it because the metamaterial again is, is just a, uh, a material that gets its properties through its shape or structure. Okay, so like example, the V-shaped flying wing of the, the B-2 stealth bomber and the Horton Brothers crafts happen to be um, very, you know, invisible. It didn't have the vertical, it didn't have a fuselage or, or vertical stabilizer, so it didn't have the radar signature that these other aircraft had. Uh, that doesn't make it a metamaterial, but the shape of it uh, gives it rise to some of these, you know, material properties. So, like, it's not just the metamaterials, because you also need, you know, the material science of what these these materials are that you're building the metamaterials out of, um, for example. Uh, so that I think that there's going to be a lot to set, be said in the future about machine learning and material science, because uh, what we can do with machine learning and um, is we can program machines to to um, use known laws of physics and chemistry to develop new materials um, using AI. Because AI can just take these pieces and figure, oh, we'll try it this way, try it that way, try it this way, try it that way, try it this way, try it that way, until it can figure out stuff that would take us millennia to figure out if we could even compute it or, or keep it all in our head at all. Um, yeah, this is... Uh, some cutting edge stuff with uh, molecular self assembly and machine learning assisted, you know, supervised and unsupervised learning and uh, some of these other algorithms like deep learning and artificial neural network learning. But yeah, lots of, uh, lots of stuff going on with this behind the scenes that you will never hear in your mainstream news and very few channels even know about it, let alone talk about it. Yeah, so if you're here, thank you for joining us. And, uh, you know, hopefully, yeah, hopefully some of these nearly 200 amazing souls will be able to take some of this information and insights into anti-gravity and do something with this. Um, yeah, perfect lens, this whole idea of uh, the super lens. And... Um, yeah, if you had this super lens, like your your surface of your craft was like a super lens. And um, what would they make the, um, what did they trap the light with in, the, in those trapped light experiments? So they, they, they pump it into a lot of these um, optical materials. And, and uh, a lot of times it's, yeah, it's like a dielectric with mi mirrors, you know? And I think that that idea is very much in line with the Casimir effect. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, lots of interesting science here for people to look up. You know, I'm not making this crap up. There really uh, are patents on this. There are really... Um, scientists who worked on this that you will never hear about or know about from the mainstream media or any of the you know channels out there that don't get deep in into this like we do here but um yeah i think uh, this is good man we, we've gone to a lot of the stuff oh this conference was cool too because in 1962 so 57 then five years later uh we have um, Joan Penrose, this is 
Roger Penrose's future wife here, takes this um, picture of this international conference on general relativity and gravitation held at the Jablona Palace near Warsaw. So you got Alfred Child. They don't know who this guy is. He's unknown. Really? Someone's got to be able to tell who this guy is. It almost looks like Bondi, but not quite. Um, Jurgen Ellers, David Finkelston, J. Question mark Fletcher, Roger Penrose. That's Roger Penrose right here on the car. Um, Dennis Schiama, Roy Kerr, almost hidden in the back right here. Josh Goldberg, we talked about him, and Rainer Sachs. Josh, Joshua Goldberg was uh, the grad student of um, Baker there, was it? Uh, God, it's hard to keep all these names straight in my head when I don't know too much about them personally. But, um, yeah, Alfred Child. Again, a lot of these, a lot of these guys... This is the real uh, Neil Bohr Institute, all the scientists there. Oh, this is Al Child's uh, memoirs or something. This is really cool. That's him right here. Yeah, a lot of real interesting history of science and, and some of this. Um, but let's get into um, where the UFO file sort of went. 19, so we got, you know, a lot of through the 60s, a lot, of, a lot of the 70s in here. The 1980s, we have the Star Wars. Um, it's called the Strategic Defense Initiative. An SDI program or Star Wars program under Reagan was really trying to pull a lot of this stuff together um, out of these sort of disparaged and, and uh, different circles. And they were trying to develop a lot of the laser technology too for other applications. There was uh, directed energy weapons research going into um, research on how to take down inter in, you know track, intercept, and shoot down um, incoming ICBMs using, you know, laser surface-to-air uh, defense sites. And um, there were also a, a number of projects to, you know, fund these these technologies and and, um, and do more with this uh, this technology. So, yeah, SDI in the, in the 70s, in the 80s, I mean, the 80s, was a big uh, a big step and then it seems to look like right at the end of the 80s early 90s is when they were really getting into the meta material they, they were just starting the meta materials research and, and uh rumors were going around about just what they might be able to do with these types of materials in the next 10 20 years and uh of course yeah, quasi crystals too around that time we know about the the quasi crystals research that was done by Daniel Schechtman. So, yeah, man, let's, uh, really interesting stuff, but the metamaterials really took off around like 2002. You don't really see much about metamaterials in the scientific literature until like around 2002, 2004. <laughs> Which is, of course, you know, five years before ATIP and all these other, you know, projects and programs. Uh, when the heck did ATIP start? It was in, uh, you know, 2007 is when it began. Yeah. So five years before that is when this, the UFO metamaterial stuff started really kicking off. Um, I wonder how many other projects there were, you know, parallel to ATIP and all the other ones. Uh, you know, because this this one just looks like it was created by Harry Reid to try to out the UFO file and that these are all Bigelow or, or other, you know, inside people that look like they're heavily connected to um, counterintelligence groups like, 
you know, psychological warfare um, operations, like, you know, how put off was. So, yeah, I'm not so sure. I, I like how, like a lot of his work, uh, just weird out by the fact that, you know, these guys haven't produced nearly what I feel like they could be putting out there. And if they were really out for disclosure and getting the science and the, and the technical information out about this out there, uh, we would have seen a lot more being done. And I, and I just, uh, I just wonder what is going on with all this, you know, publicly, you know, it just seems like there's, a lot more going on behind the scenes than we're being told. Uh, but yeah, you know, Eric Davis, of course, wrote these papers on, you know, stargates and negative energy wormholes talked about, um, using, you know, uh, he talked about a number of methods for creating negative energy. And one of them was using squeeze states, uh, squeezed light, which led me to a lot of interesting research on, you know, the squeezed light stuff as it connects with uh, Hal Putoff's work. That's one of the things that Hal Putoff has said. But yeah, the squeezed light idea is you pump pump the uh, light into this cavity around your craft, and then you, you can squeeze it a different way. So, um Lots of interesting things you can do with squeezing light. So. What is the guy who did the razor blades? Smarter every day. Is that a squeeze light? Razor blades. On the wrench. She did like this. I'll have to find that video. But anyways, uh, I'm going to open this up to uh, at the after party. We've been going for an hour and a half now. Yeah, light acts like a fluid. It's liquid light, man. Dude, I've been... I, didn't, I haven't been live in weeks, dude. A lot of shit's been going on. So I just... Look, I'm just going to put it out there, I guess. Friggin There's some people that approached me and uh, who think that Amy Eskridge didn't kill herself, that she was uh, had learned about this anti-gravity stuff from her father, who was a NASA scientist involved with this. And that, you know, there was easy target for her because because of the um, history of some mental illness and other things. So uh, if that's the case, then, man, I would I would hate to see someone in my group have the same fate happen to them because I've gotten a lot of threats very indirectly happened in the last you know month. A lot of really bad stuff has just happened around me and the people in my group and, and other things. Um, people have come in and told us things, including the guy that said, Hey, you know, I created this wormhole in my garage doing experiments that I learned about watching your channel. And two weeks later, uh, I got a knock on my door from, you know, the CIA basically in the DOD telling me I, I had to stop and, and sign NDAs or they're going to kill me. Um, so this leads to the very real question. And, and he tells us, right, he's like, the stuff that you're working on, the stuff that you're putting out there, you're very, very close to this, more closer than anyone else on the Internet talking about this. Of course, there's no one else on the Internet really talking about this. Um, and they said that, um, you know, what what happens, you know, two weeks, two months from now when someone in your group actually figures this out. And um, man, that just kind of like threw me for a loop because this is what I've been like thinking about and working towards. Yeah, we're going to do disclosure. We're going to, we're going to, you know, bring this all out. And, and uh, 
And then I just kind of got reminded this past month about how easy it would be for them to squash me like a tiny little bug. And they've made that very, very clear. Um, yeah, lots of lots of bad people around, man. The whole fucking situation. It's just so I would need to be 20 times bigger than I am in order to, you know, bring disclosure out. That basically these entities are out there pushing this fake, false version of disclosure. It's not never gonna lead anybody anywhere. They're just gonna keep people chasing their tails. And they're going to shut down guys like me who are you know, doing the experiments, doing the science, trying to talk about the real history and, and doing good research. And they'll never show people like, they'll never show that image to the public of UFOlogies. So they're going to show people like Corbell. That's why Corbell gets on these shows and, and gets put on Fox News. And, and, and so he can make the community look like um, a clueless buffoon. Um, yeah, so... Uh, because if Bob Lazar was telling the truth, he wouldn't have gone on Larry King or Joe Rogan. We wouldn't be talking about him today. There wouldn't have been specials on unsolved mysteries about him that, you know, they, they would have they would have taken him out, man, because Bob Lazar is not the real deal. And I've already talked about this. Yeah, they basically said, you know, hey, there's a couple of places you could apply for, to and we'll, we'll, we'll definitely take you. Um, yeah. I just, uh, I don't know what to do right now, man, guys. I'm caught, I'm caught up because it's like, I love talking about the information and getting it out and, and doing this stuff. But I've just been reminded this past month that um, they will kill me and they will make it look like an accident and they will prevent any of the real technical details and info from reaching the public ever. Just, you know, like, they've done with everything else so uh man yeah that's that's where i've been at and it's not a it's not a not a good feeling not a good place to be because i was so you know happy about the fact that we were getting so close and that i you know working with a number of labs right now which i feel could make a breakthrough in, in a year or two if not you know, shorter than that. And now I've just been reminded that, you know, hey, I'm probably going to be better off just disappearing. And I don't know. I don't know what I don't know what's going to happen, because then I've been warned and told all these things that will happen if this technology gets out to the public. And, you know, oh, well, you, this could ha wind up in hands of, you know, Putin or, or some of these other guys and, and stuff. Um, man. Yeah, I'd have to create like a whole another channel and and not and disguise it and build it up big or something, man. Because they've already like, they've already figured out my channel. They know what I'm up to and they've already made the moves. They have a kill switch in place. Like everything, man. And and yeah, it's it's messed up, man. So. We, I have hope for disclosure, man. And like now I'm like, you know, I, I've been pushing this whole disclosure for five years since 2018 and really working hard to educate and try to get the truth out to the public. And now I'm just in a position where it's like, man, these guys uh, are in such control over all this stuff and they put such liars and frauds out there in the main public for us to you know look at and think are the real deal and um yeah i just don't know man um i'm gonna leave it at that but i i need to talk to some people i've tried to reach out to some big name sources and and, and say say how what i feel about this you know hey if someone makes a breakthrough i need to know that you're on our side and i've gotten some good response i've gotten some positive feedback from a number of people that we can go to and do this with but i've just been really warned about how close we are and, and then some of the things that could happen and what what we're opening up here and i said well if i'm not going to open it up i don't know who else will and i just I guess I, I just don't know the way the world is going. I, I feel like basically what they say is that, you know, you unlock this technology and, and you, you give 
every human on the planet the power to save humanity and kill humanity. It's just like you've given a God staff to everyone on the planet. And, um, you know, now you just have to trust that everyone's going to be, you know, good enough to do the right things with this God technology that they're going to build with it and be constructive and not uh, destructive, you know, that we're going to get Captain America and not Thanos, you know? So, man, we deserve it, but dude, would we kill ourselves with it? What would we do with it? That's the question is, yeah, we, 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 maybe we don't maybe we need it we could really use it but do we deserve it have we been have we really been good enough i mean think about it we're on, of all days of the year i mean are, is humanity on the on the naughty list <laughs> or are they on the good list you know um man yeah like gandalf says Maybe that's the best. I don't know anymore, man. I don't know anymore. And I don't, I don't know what to do. It's like, I, I've reached like, I've reached the top of the mountain and now I'm like, all right, well, I can either go back down. <laughs> I don't know. I kept trying to think of an analogy to describe where I'm at right now, but I'm basically like, dude, I haven't made a stream for like almost a month. Cause I'm just like, what do I even say? What do I even talk about? I, I at one point I was going to talk about, um, the new terahertz, uh, MIT terahertz camera, cheap, right? So uh, MIT made uh, these, they developed a really low cost terahertz camera. And um, yeah, so I had this whole idea that, you know, we could build a bunch of these terahertz cameras and just give them to all the convenience store owners because these terahertz cameras can, um, they can actually see through paper. So I had this whole idea that, you know, well, you put these in everyone's hands, they're going to be able to uh, lottery tickets, the scratch tickets, scratch lottery tickets are going to be completely obsolete within five years, bro. Once these cameras come out on the market and like, I don't want to say this because it's like, oh, man, I was first I was like, oh, what if you had like a whole bunch of these? We could just scan all the lottery tickets and find all the winners and just you, you could have every store clerk scanning all the tickets so that, you know, you're only selling losers. And you'll find that twenty thousand dollar winner, before, and, you know, because you can just see right through the scratch ticket paper. You can literally use this camera to like look right through it. Um, so. I had this whole idea. Well, I can make a movie about, I can make like a short film where these MIT students do this and then they start, you know, scanning all the lottery tickets and it shuts and it creates this. I mean, dude, that would just create a big boondoggle for the, the lottery tickets. Scratch tickets would be completely obsolete, dude. They'd be like, no one would buy them anymore. They'd all be losers because you just scan them for the winners. Um, anyways, uh, yeah, I had that whole idea. I was going to do a video on that and talk about it and, and, um, you know, just how we're creating new technology, which is going to hack all of our old ways of life and just things we take for granted as normal are just not going to be exist in the next, in, in, in like five, 20 years. Right. Um, yeah. All right. So to me, I would, I would love to get a, a team together and make this into a movie and please cast me as one of the roles. Um, if you are a producer or a director and want to, want to take my idea and use it, or at least give me credit for it. But anyways, uh, yeah, yeah, dude, and they even published the one somewhere is like where the winners are still. So you don't know where the winners are and at least what role to buy um, or what what type of ticket to buy. But yeah, the whole the whole idea of scratch lottery tickets. Man, we can make them completely obsolete within five to ten years with that this technology. People don't even realize it. They use this tech to see beneath paint and all kinds of other stuff. And it's, it's just the only thing keeping it out of the hands of every store clerk in America is uh, the cost. So. Heck yeah. And um, but yeah, I wanted to just let people know where I'm at. So like if you don't see any videos for me in a while, uh, 
that's why because i'm just i'm really just nose down in the trenches working on developing this technology and figuring this stuff out um again the drives are topological in nature so um and, and it and it's like those flying uh, donut pulses, right? Those are example of these uh, topological wave patterns. So, so this is a these. If you created a, a device which would produce these uh, donut pulses, you would attract the attention of uh, the DoD. You'll get a, you'll get a knock on your door um, because it's a topological system, and you're creating you know these wormholes which are going to be picked up by these gravitational uh, wave detectors. Um, so the the real Key language, because uh, they changed the terminology. Uh, it used to be called these flying magnetic donut pulses, but uh, you'll find it in the literature under spatiotemporal optical vortices. So that's the complex, um, more precise language of saying of talking about these things, these STOVs, and apparently. If you can create one of these spatiotemporal optical vortices and create it big enough and strong enough, then you can warp that. Uh, uh, you can actually break that uh, space-time barrier down and, and create that, you know, ripping or the the topological ripping of the space-time, uh, which would, which uh, is strong enough to break that tear in the face space-time fabric, um, possibly producing anti-gravity but also very definitely uh, setting off the detectors that the DOD has for seeing anyone working on this type of stuff. So um, maybe we could do it in a, I don't know if it would work in a Faraday cage. I don't even know if a Faraday cage would protect you from this type of, uh, it might, you know. So I don't know. I, again, this is a lot of these guys working in buildings, which they can see right through and know what's going on. So, they create one of these things, you're going to uh, get a call. Uh, but yeah, these sp spatio-temporal, that's space-time. Mm -hmm. uh, you get your facts straight, dude. It's been proven that Bob Lazar worked at Los Alamos National Labs. Okay, It's also been proven that he worked there as an electronics technician for Kirk Meyer Corporation. Okay, So get your facts straight, Logan. All right? He never, there's no evidence that he worked at Area 51, okay? There's no pay stubs from Area 51, from eg &G. There's no employment records from eg &G. In fact, eg &G turned him down at the interview because he's friends with John Lear, one of the biggest blabbermouths in Las Vegas. So they definitely weren't going, weren't going to give him the job at Area 51. You know, so just, he did get a job as a pimp, though. He did get a job installing, you know, CCT security cameras in the uh, Crystal Cove apartment complex and catching John's uh, Jeffrey Epstein style blackmailing them. Um, so that is who Bob Lazar really is. OK. Dude, no, he, we have evidence that, you know, well, he was selling this fake UFO story to a gullible public through John Lear and George Knapp that he was actually, um, you know, pimping uh or pandering uh working with prostitutes and uh you know again great yeah and area 52 is tonopah test range yeah did you know there was an actual site four at tonopah test range during the mid 80s so there was two places called site four during the during the time bob lazar claims he was at this site four at papoose lake um, which there's never no evidence of any base ever being at Papoose Lake. Jerry Friedman walked out there proving uh, that there's no security on that facility um, in that area. And also um, the whole idea that he promoted this site four as a secret facility. Well, site four was two different site secret facilities. One was at area 52 or Tonopah. And that's where they did all the anti-radar, anti-Soviet radar stuff at. And the other site four was at plant 42 where they built all the B2 bombers. So yeah, we have two top secret locations in the late eighties called site four where they're doing top secret classified stuff. And then we have Bob Lazar coming out and saying that, Oh, I worked at this alien research facility out in Papoose Lake. It was perfect disinformation, man. And that's why they didn't kill him. 
And that's why they instead, you know, he got blown up and into the into a super UFO rock star. And um, that's the reason he's on, you know, he's there. They brought him back, man. He's on Larry King and Joe Rogan, dude. You won't find the truth on these channels and on the, these mainstream, you know, networks anymore. They do not. They make sure that they censor it as much as possible from the, these places. And they put disinformation agent out. So disinformation agents on that stuff man so it's like again you have to know that operation mockingbird is a reality okay that the media okay and the government anything they say you immediately should assume i mean don't, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily a lie just because they said it but your first assumption you should make when you hear anything on your television Anything from mainstream news this is why I didn't fall for the COVID op. And so many people did and were calling me an anti-scientist for my, you know, views on, oh, well, I'm going to be the control group. Okay. I'm going to be the control group and sit this, this one out on the vaccine. Well, I'm glad I did that. And, um, and, and now lots of people are realizing that, oh crap, this guy maybe does understand science a little bit. And, and, you know, he's maybe a little bit unconventional, but, uh, I understand that. Operation Mockingbird is very real. They have a CIA agent in every single news organization, every single magazine, every single newspaper, every single TV station. There is a CIA editor on that board, like making sure that everything passes a check mark before it can be aired. So that you know that anything you see on mainstream television and National Geographic, right? A prime example would be, you know, National Geographic um, saying that they used 175, 170 pounds of thermite um, to show that, uh, you know, you couldn't melt a steel, a vertical steel column with thermite, that the thermite. Uh, yeah, so their whitewash, their thermite whitewash was debunked. So they did 170 pounds of thermite. My buddy John Cole uh, cut a vertical steel column in his backyard using a couple uh, clay, uh, clay bricks, roofing tiles, clay roofing tiles, and some well-placed thermite in, in a plastic wrap, uh, you know, and he was able to do it with under a pound of thermite. So, so National Grid Geographic is a complete fraud. They did this knock-up joke demonstration and made fun of conspiracy theorists, called them all retarded. So they, oh, you can't even melt the 170 pounds of thermite, and we can't even melt steel columns. Well, my buddy did it in his backyard with less than a pound and uh, made fools out of National Geographic. And it gets zero attention and zero news. Um, but th again, that's what you have. The mainstream media, they're fucking liars, dude. And then you have to question everything that you get from them. Question everything you get from me too, bro. I want you to prove me. I love it. There's nothing better when someone's like, oh, you said this and it was, you weren't quite right. I proved you wrong or you were completely wrong about this. And I get to learn that way. That's how I learn. You don't learn if you're not being wrong and there's nothing wrong with being wrong. Just is it, the only thing that's wrong is when you refuse to correct it. Never doesn't become a mistake until we refuse to correct it. So, yeah, the CIA is essential for our national security. Oh, there's probably a couple of them, dude. They, I guarantee you these guys watch my streams, dude. They, a lot of them love me, man. They're like, wow, this, you know, some of them hate you. Some of them like you, dude. I, you get them all, dude, you know. I had one guy call me up and was like, dude, I was assigned to your case. Can't tell. Well, he couldn't tell me straight up that he was assigned to my case, but that's how he found me. Loves my work. Open them up to a whole new world of thinking, new new ideas about all this stuff. You get the bigger picture, man. You realize that, oh, my God. How about Elon Musk saying that, you know, all the Twitter conspiracies, right? He said every conspiracy theory that the public had about Twitter turned out to be true. Just imagine, you know, like we get, you know, they get the back door to a company like this and he gets all those... Twitter emails and the, and the bombshell where he releases all this stuff and shows all this. Just imagine if we could actually get those CIA JFK files or any of these FBI files. I want to leave you guys off uh, with the history of COINTELPRO so that people can um, 
see just how awesome this this actually happened over Christmas. So the burglary, it was actually a burglary um, that exposed Corp, uh, Cohen, COINTELPRO and they cased this FBI You're office. You're in democracy. Out. They cased out this FBI office. This woman was one of the women who did the robbery, right? She worked with a bunch, a group with a bunch of professors and some of these people who were trying to expose these corrupt assholes at the FBI. And they, they, they stuck, they staked out this office for months. And then uh, I think over Christmas, they went and broke into the, uh, broke into the actual offices and did a burglary. And in that burglary, they stole all these FBI documents that they were, they were these FBI agents working to actively subvert all the student groups, you know, uh, on the colleges nearby and stuff. So they, they found all these documents, including the COINTELPRO document. And that's wh why we actually have these, some of the most crucial documents exposing uh, these criminal assholes in our government uh, came through uh, illegal means. We had, to, we had to break in, we had to have criminals uh, break into the FBI's offices and steal their files and expose this in order to get it out. This would have never seen the public, never seen the light of day if, you know, unless unless someone did that, broke into the FBI's office and, and, and published that stuff. Um, or if, uh, you know, someone at the FBI could have been brave enough, uh, risk they, they would they would have risked their career. They would have gone to jail for for exposing state secrets, too. So it's, it's just like. Um, it's glad that these these students did it and, and uh, they, they went out and came forward after the uh, statute of limitations had run out where they could no longer be charged retroactively for their crimes. They came forward on, you know, Amy Goodman and admitted to the whole thing and, you know, exposed it. But um, that, that, that wouldn't have happened if an FBI agent on the inside, of course, they would have been able to track down where the leak came from. And that agent would have been tried and convicted of, uh, you know, violation of the State Secrets Act. And they would have been sentenced to uh, prison like Bob Lazar would have been if he was telling the truth. Um, so. Yeah, this is, um, yeah, 1971, I think it was, uh, in, yeah, it was actually it was in March. So they didn't do it during Christmas. They did it during the Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier fight. So they had the big, the biggest boxing fight. It was like the biggest, you know, so they waited for that night to, to, to do it because they knew all the FBI agents would be busy watching the big boxing fight. And, um, but they got away with it. I don't know if you could do that these days with all the security technologies and, and, and all the, the same kind of things. But um, God, thank God that they did that because, um, you know, our na I just imagine how much uns less secure and less uh, free our nation would be if uh, these brave patriots uh, didn't um, conspire to commit a crime against the FBI. I mean, they, they literally create a conspiracy and broke into the FBI's offices to steal these documents and, and, and produce that. But kudos to them, man. Um, I think that we should pardon Edward Snowden and Julia Assange um, 100%. I think that it's a clear indication that we're being ruled by criminals when you know journalists, real journalists are prosecuted and, and all the journalists that we have, we do get are, are basically just CIA mouthpieces and uh, propagandists and liars. So, well, the element 115 came from May 1989 issue of Scientific American, as I've shown the whole island of stability thing and whatnot. So, yeah, it's craziness. Anyways, um, here's the live stream, stream yard link again. Yes, pardon Snowden. Heck yeah. Thanks, man. I hope uh, to bring you more. Thank you for the $10 super chat. Merry Christmas. And uh, Merry Christmas to all and to all a good night. Here's the StreamYard link if you'd like to join. I'm going to end the uh, live stream, but feel free to join me behind the scenes so we can uh, we can hang out and, uh, and chat. I've already got some people uh, lining up. So what's up, guys? Hello. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. We're going to end yeah. it here. I'll see you uh, back. Yeah.